Well, hey, everybody, happy Sunday to you. Happy graduation Sunday to you. Congratulations to all our graduates. It's a big deal, something we're celebrating. No small task to graduate, so uh, congratulations. How many of you have ever been to a graduation ceremony of some sort down through the years? Yeah, almost everybody here has. And you know what people like the commencement folks who, you know, they bring in to give you this rousing, inspiring you know, kind of speech do, usually they just say a bunch of junk, don't they? Like every now and again, not. But most of the time, it's just hogwash. It really is. Like they'll say things like, you know, follow your heart. It's all these like slogans, you know, follow your heart, which I don't know, like your heart can be deceitful, the Bible tells us. Or, you know, you can do anything, which you can't. You, I mean, you really can't, you know. Uh, if you could do anything you wanted to do, I'd be in the NBA. I would not be here, you know. You know, or never look back, you know, which uh, you should from time to time. Remember where you came from kind of thing. This, it's just stuff like that, you know, be true to yourself, you know, just a bunch of rubbish. You know, I remember what my mom told me right after I graduated uh, the day after I graduated, actually, from high school, I'll never forget what she told me. She woke me up early in the morning before she rolled off to work, and she said, David, now that you've graduated high school, get a job. <laughs> That's what she said. Go get a job. She was talking about like a summer job. I was headed for college that, that fall, but during my high school years, I was involved in a lot. I mean, a lot. I was in sports. I uh, played in the band. I was in a lot of clubs and activities. I was involved in our student ministry at uh, the church. And because of that, my parents said, hey, when you're in high school, you know, since you're involved in all these things, you don't have to get a job. But the day after graduation, all that was over. Like, no more clubs, no more sports, you know, uh, no more band, aged out of the youth group, you know, time to get a job. And so that's what I did. I actually went out that day and got a job. I had a job by noon, even pulled my first shift that afternoon. Worked at a place called Acme Sports. No kidding. Acme Sports. Like if the Roadrunner ever needed a new baseball glove <laughs> or the Coyote needed an extra anvil, you know, they'd feel right at home at Acme Sports. That's the first thing my mom told me after I graduated. Time to get a job. Now, I want to tell you something now that you've graduated, and it's not uh, get a job. I'll, some of you will. Some of you um, will go off to school. Some of you do both, you know. And it's not, you know, follow your heart or you can do anything. You know, it's all that silliness, nothing like that. Instead, what I want to hold up to these graduates, and really all of us uh, today, is summed up for us beautifully in the Bible, in the book of Titus. Like if you have a Bible in one way, shape, or form, I'd love for you to get to the book of Titus. And Titus contains one of the greatest statements in the entire Bible. And it's really a foundational statement from which springs what we're even doing here, this church thing, this Christian thing. You know, there are only three chapters in this short little letter the Apostle Paul penned, and he was writing to uh, Titus, who was ministering on the island of Crete at the time. And Crete, an island south of Greece, was made up of many towns, and in many of these towns were these new churches that Paul and Titus had established together. And Paul's writing to offer guidance to Titus about how to lead and uh, instruct and guide these churches, because these churches were vulnerable to all kinds of things that could take them off course and derail them. In fact, in chapter 2, the uh, very first verse there of chapter 2, Paul says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. He says, you must teach sound doctrine, Titus. And there's a reason for that. Because if sound doctrine, like sound thinking, sound theology is not taught, well, then people will gravitate toward and grab onto unsound doctrine and unsound thinking and unsound theology. If people are not taught to believe the right things, they will believe bizarre things. And that's precisely what was happening on the island of Crete. And it's no different in our day, is it? And you know, CCC, it's predictable. Like if people don't believe the right things, like if our thinking is offline with sound doctrine, then people will buy into any number of just bizarre things and off thinking. So at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul starts by saying, remind the people of the sound doctrine. 
you know. And in the first couple of verses there, chapter 3, he instructs Titus to remind the people about some basic obedience. But in verses 3 and following here, he reminds them of essentially the gospel message. The gospel message. And this is what I want all of us, especially you graduates, to really grab onto today. For those of you who haven't been around church very long, the word gospel simply means good news. Did you know that the church has some good news? Really, really, really good news. In a world full of uh, bad news, in a world full of tough news, in a world full of disappointing news or discouraging news or dividing news, the church booms gloriously and lovingly. Very, 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 very good news. And it's important that we consistently and continually circle back to and are clear on this glorious good news that the church is entrusted with because so much is at stake. Oh, so much is at stake. And Titus 3, 3 through 7 is generally regarded by biblical scholars as perhaps the most succinct statement in the New Testament about the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is what I want to give all of us today. Young and old, doesn't matter. Graduate or not yet graduated. Or maybe graduated a long time ago. Or never going to graduate. Or whatever. Anybody. It's for everybody, all right? I want us to remind us of this glorious good news. And verse 3 says this. The Apostle Paul says to Titus, remind them of this, Titus. He says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. All right, so this first part here is about our great need. This is sometimes called the doctrine of sin. Now, Paul does a wonderful thing here. He makes a shift in grammar because in the first two verses there, uh, he says to Titus, remind the people to be obedient. And we'd expect him to say in verse 3 here, because at one time they were foolish. But he doesn't do that. He actually makes a little shift. He puts it in the first person plural. He says, we were foolish. We were disobedient. And Paul says to Titus, it's not just the people at Crete, you know. Remind the people, remind them to be obedient. He says, no, no, no. He says, Titus, that's you and that's me. And you know what? That's you and me too, CCC. This verse is you and me too. And people don't like to hear this in our day. The doctrine of sin. The sin problem. They think it's too harsh. They think it's oppressive. You know, David Brooks, he wrote a great book called The Road to Character some years ago. And right before it went to you know, print, he sent it to his editor you know, for some last edits and uh, said, hey, what do, you, what do you think about this? And the editor came back because David Brooks had written in there the word sin. And the word sin was in this book, Road to Character, like 50 or 60 times or so. And the editor came back and he said, hey, I like it. We just got to find a different word than sin. And he's like, there is no other word for sin, you know? He said, well, people don't like to hear that. And he's like, what do you want me to do? See, people don't like to hear this. A lot of people think, oh, those other people out there, they may be deceived, you know, or disobedient. They might have a problem, but not me, not us, you know. It's them. And Paul says, no, 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 we. Or you can think of it like this. It's wedding season nowadays, isn't it? Late spring, going into summer, you know. It's wedding season. And I find myself at a of weddings and doing a lot of weddings. And you see this at weddings, like when young love is springing up. You know, the sparks are flying, you know, they're all excited. They're all dressed up. They look beautiful. And you, here's what you hear them say or people say about them. They say, oh, they're so wonderful. He's so awesome. She's so terrific. You know, and you hear them, they're perfect. You know, it's all drippy, sappy, <laughs> syrupy stuff, you know. They're just awesome. They're perfect. And the truth is they're not. They're not. They look good today. Give it some time. (laughs) Let's see what happens. They have a sin problem just like everybody else. See? 
And I don't know about you, but one of my biggest problems, I think, partly because I grew up in the church, was that for a long time I didn't understand what it is that I'm capable of apart from God. Like you look at verse 3 here and the description that's right there, like apart from the grace and power of God, I'm here to tell you that that would be my life. And the key word there is the word enslaved. Like Paul talks about this elsewhere in the Bible. He says, I do the very things I don't want to do. Apart from the power and grace of God in my life, no matter how bad I want to do good, I find myself doing the very things I don't want to do. I'm trapped. I'm enslaved. You ever find yourself doing things that you don't want to do? Like in 12-step programs, the first step is usually I'm not powerful enough to control all my thoughts or feelings or actions on my own. Like in some areas of my life, I'm out of control. You know, John Foreman, he has a song called I Made a Mess of Me. He says, I am my own affliction. I am my own disease. Ain't no drug that they could sell. Ain't no drug to make me well. The sickness is myself. And that is true. That's the doctrine of sin. But like, let's just think about out of controlness for a moment. Like whether it's eating or anger or fear or spending or manipulation or pride or envy or insecurity, guilt, you know, destructive words, destructive habit, like whatever. How many of you would say there's at least one area in my life, like just at least one, where I can't perfectly direct all my thoughts, feelings, or behaviors? Like I'm out of control with whatever. You fill in the blank. How many of you would say, yeah, that's, that's true of me? Yeah, I mean, the truth is in some area or another, every one of us is out of control. And apart from the power of God, we would be fully. Like, I mean, imagine for a moment if the restraining power of God was gone from your life. Like no whispers of God's spirit to make your conscience tender. No Bible to give you support and guide you. No church to encourage you and spur you on. Like imagine the worst, darkest, most destructive tendencies that you are capable of taking root in your life until they become habits a thousand times stronger than they are right now, unchecked by any power, with no regret, no remorse. Like that would be you, and that would be me. So listen, instead of taking it for granted, you think about where you'd be if God left you on your own. Like what sin would do to you if he left you on your own, left you on your own. But God did not leave you on your own. He did not leave me on my own. He did not leave us on our own. And this is the heart of the good news right here because the very next verse, Paul gives this beautiful phrase. Check it out. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And in this phrase right here, in this verse right here, Paul goes from our need, like our great dilemma, the doctrine of sin, to the source of our salvation. This is sometimes called the doctrine of justification. We're using all these big words today because it's graduation Sunday, right? <laughs> doctrine of justification. Like you can handle it, you know? He saved us. That's the key phrase there. He saved us, not because of our righteousness, but because of his mercy, which is Jesus Christ through the cross. And this is what makes the Christian faith unique from all other religions, all other faiths of the world. Like, it's fascinating how similar every world religion is. You've probably heard that before, like that basically all religions are the same. They're headed the same place, you know, going in the same direction. And in some ways, that premise is true. All religions are built on the same singular premise, except for Jesus, except for Christianity, the gospel is unique. See, all of the religions say, you know, you get to God. You get to a relationship with God, a connection to God. Like, he's up here, and you're down here. And if you're going to have a relationship with God, like, you need to climb the ladder to get there. You know, so you got to be good enough, or you got to be smart enough, or you got to do the right technique. You know, you got to have the right practices, you know. Maybe you got to meditate or empty yourself. Or some say you got to suffer enough, you know. Or you got to pray and fast at the right time in the right way. And maybe, maybe you'll find some favor in God's eyes. You'll get there somehow. 
But it is up to you to get there, you see. It's all on you. Or here in our country, in our culture, here's the way we like to say it, you know. We'll say things like, just be a good person. You know, be a good moral individual. Like, do some good stuff. Steer clear of the biggies, you know, the big ones. And do some good stuff. And at the end, like if the good stuff outweighs the bad stuff, you know, because nobody's perfect or whatever, but if you got enough good stuff in your ledger, you know, you'll be okay. But it's about your morality or your goodness or your energy or your work, your effort, your self-righteousness. But the problem is you can't. You can't be good enough, righteous enough, clever enough, disciplined enough. We all fall short, the Bible says. We all make a mess of ourselves. I make a mess of me. You make a mess of you. It's a problem. It's the great problem. On our own, we all fall short of the glory of God. And deep down, we know it. But then there's verse 4. Thank God for verse 4. Hallelujah for verse 4. The kindness of And love of God our Savior appeared, and he saved us, not because of us, but because of him. See, Jesus comes to us. God makes his way to us. See, you and I, we are are so much worse than we think we are. But God is so much better than we think he is. Because God sent Jesus And Jesus lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we deserve to die. And in doing so, he bridged a gap so that we could make our way back to God. And it is all a gift, every bit of it. It's all a gift. And I don't know, maybe you, you know, everything you've ever had in your life, you've had to earn the hard way. You know, maybe pretty much everything you've got is the result of sweat and toil and your own strength and ingenuity and grit. But not this. Not this CCC, not this graduates, this is a gift. So imagine for a moment that if it were not, imagine where you would be if God was not a merciful God, but a hard God. Imagine if your destiny hinged on you getting it all right, on your righteousness. Imagine the anxiety of never knowing whether or not you really are good enough to make the cut. Imagine that no matter how hard you try, you could never please God. Never, ever. You'd never be adequate. You'd never be acceptable in his eyes. That's where we'd be. Except, Paul says, when the kindness and love of God has appeared, he saved us. Not because of our acts of righteousness, but because of his mercy. So, Community Christian Church, I remind you every time you hear the word mercy... Every time you say the word grace, every time you sense God kind of smile on your life, every time you hold a piece of bread that Jesus said was his body given for you, and every time you hold the cup that Jesus said was his blood poured out for you, it is no accident. It is no coincidence. And it's nothing to be taken for granted because that is your salvation. And that is the good news. And then the second half of verse 5 is just as good. Just as good. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is another part of the wonder of the saving grace of God. Like he goes from our need for it, the doctrine of sin, to the source of it, the doctrine of justification, and now the ongoing result of it. This is what's sometimes called the doctrine of regeneration. And it's the idea of being made alive. To regenerate something is to bring it to life, you know, renewal by the very presence and power of the Spirit of God. You are brought to life. From spiritual death, you have been brought to life. And that's something to remember every, every once in a while, you know. I used to be dead in my sins, but now I'm made alive by God. Thank God he made me alive. And only God can do this. Only God can bring spiritual life from spiritual death. Only God can regenerate souls that are sick from sin. And this is why baptism is such a big, big deal. See, baptism is the marker moment when somebody says, like, I'm acknowledging my great need for God's redemptive work in my life. I'm acknowledging that I got a sin problem, and the remedy 
is Jesus Christ, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. And I'm, I'm identifying with that very thing, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through baptism, going under the water, dying to my old self, rising to a new life, focused on Jesus with him at the center, you see. I know a lot of times the word baptism gets thrown around a lot, and there are lots of ideas that come to our mind with baptism. You know, sometimes a lot of folks think about their christening, you know, uh, a sprinkling of water that happened to some of you by your parents when you were a baby. And that's not really how the Bible speaks about baptism. Like when the Bible speaks of baptism, it ties it to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So I go down into the water, and I come up again to this new life, just like Jesus did. I identify with Jesus in that way. I am baptized into him, you see. I'm putting my chips in with him. I'm saying, hey, the guy that died and came back to life, I'm with him. I'm with him. Whenever I think of this, uh, I think about something that happened to me a few years back. Uh, it was when I came home one day after a really tough, challenging day. It was a really emotionally draining day, and I was a bit worn out. I was actually a little on edge. And as I walked into my house, I came in through the kitchen there, and there was a room full of teenage boys in my kitchen, standing around our island there, stuffing their faces with an enormous amount of food that I'm quite certain that I had purchased in one way or another. <laughs> and all these, you know, teenage boys that were standing around in our kitchen, I didn't recognize any of them. You know, I've been around... You know, my kids' friends a lot, but I didn't recognize any of these guys. And none of them at first bothered looking up from the food shoveling that was going on there <laughs> until one of them, like a fuzzy-faced 15-year-old, turned to me, and he had just stuffed an entire slice of pizza into his mouth, maybe two, I don't know. But he had stuffed that thing into his mouth, and he turned, and he looked at me, and he said to me, hey, bro. Now, I cannot stand when somebody calls me, you know, bro or dude or anything like that, you know. I don't even like when people I know call me bro. I don't even like when my brothers call me bro, and they are my bro. <laughs> so anyway, Fuzzy Face Pizza Mouth calls me bro, and I decide I'm going to walk over to him, and I'm going to get some things straight about how to introduce yourself to someone, especially if you're standing in their home eating food that they provided, you know. Like, we're, we're going to class 101 of man school, you know. And as I'm walking straight towards Fuzzy Face Pizza Mouth, I'm sure my face was not fuzzy and warm at all. <laughs> and when I'm walking over to him, all of a sudden, the door to our basement is, you know, right beside our, our kitchen there. And my, bro my oldest son, Daniel, uh, comes up from the basement to the kitchen. And as soon as he, he kind of bursts through the door, and he's like, hey, Dad. And he introduces me to all these guys. He said, this is Dustin and Steve and George and Stinky and Fuzzy, and I don't... <laughs> I don't remember their names, really, to tell you the truth, but he's like, we got a video game tournament going on, a FIFA video game tournament going on in the basement, and so these guys are with me, and he just de-escalated the room there. He de-escalated everything I was feeling, and I'm pretty sure Fuzzy Face, when he saw me, he said, I'm with him. <laughs> I'm with Daniel, you know, and everything was cool because they were with my son. See, because... They're with my son. We're good. Like, make yourself at home. Try not to choke on a slice of pizza. Don't burn the house down, that sort of stuff. <laughs> Baptism, you understand, is when you say, I'm with him. And Jesus says to the Father, they're with me. And the Son absorbs the wrath of the Father for your sake. See, baptism is a declaration it's a stake in the ground kind of moment it's a holy moment where this great drama gets worked into our souls and listen some of you have never taken that step before you've never been baptized you've never entered into this covenantal relationship with god and accepted his grace and mercy and forgiveness for your life you've never identified with jesus in this way and i got to tell you it's time like what are you waiting for some of you said, I'm with him, but you've never taken this step. Some of you were christened as an infant, but you never decided for yourself and have been baptized. Well, this is your step, and this is your chance. You know, we've got a big baptism celebration coming up in just a, a few weeks, the second Sunday of June, June 9th. 
It's going to be a great day here at CCC as we celebrate people taking that step, and it's totally worth celebrating, which is why we're going to have a giant big old tent out there in the back parking lot. We're going to have a bunch of food trucks, you know, and a bunch of inflatable games, and we will throw out a deal that day. I guarantee it. We do this all the time. We'll make a special little deal for some special people that we'll announce during our service there, a special deal for some lucky someones. It's going to be a great deal, you know, great deal, but not as great of a deal as what Paul's talking about here in Titus 3, not even close. You know, Paul ends this incredible section by talking about where all this ultimately leads, our ultimate hope, our future hope, our eternal hope, remind the people of the future hope of the glorious gospel, he tells, he tells Titus, which means we have just this bright and glorious future, people who are found in Jesus Christ. You know, graduates, you're getting ready to go out into the world, being launched into the world in a lot of ways you already have been, and there will be all sorts of doctrine that's thrown your way, all kinds of thinking for you to consider, you know, all sorts of beliefs, in a lot of ways, people try to, the world tries to press it into you, you know. And you will probably hear, I would say, you'll probably hear or be told that the church, it's full of uh, old news or outdated news, like that the world's passed it by. Don't you believe it? Don't believe a bit of it, not for a hot second. You remember again Titus 3, 3 through 7, and you build your life on it because it's the only sure thing. It's the most stable place there is. That's why Paul ends that thing. We put that back up there. He says, this, put that back up there. This is a trustworthy saying, he says. You can take it to the bank because of Jesus Christ. So let's take a few moments now and let's reflect on Jesus and his saving grace, the gift of God's kindness and mercy through Jesus' atoning death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. You know, it's interesting, Jesus, he said, whenever you gather like this, he actually wanted to put this back in the center, to put it forefront in our lives by having us celebrate communion, taking a little piece of bread, reminds us of Jesus' body given for us, and some juice reminds us of Jesus' blood that was spilled for us. He wanted us to put that right back in the center so that we'll never forget. So let's do that now. Let's remember, and let's thank God for his saving grace through Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate communion now. Any student would not want to miss it. So we'll see the rest of you right back here next week. Have a good week, everybody. I wasn't sure at the end there if you were going to pray or not, so I held off for a minute. For where?